because this is something I've been preparing for for about 10 years to do this kind of talk. Uh, I'm going to introduce the first part of the program, but tonight's presentation will focus on the African presence in India, but specifically it will focus on what are called the black untouchables of India. Now, I was talking to somebody last night. I'm grateful to have had a chance with Brother Velu uh, to be on Intervisions a couple nights ago and front page uh, yesterday. And I was talking to somebody about the untouchables, and they told me that they had in turn discussed it with somebody else, and they said that they thought they were talking about Al Capone and Elliot Ness, you know, when it comes to the untouchables, right? But tonight we're talking about the black untouchables, and that means as I understand it, that the very touch, in some cases, the voice, or even the shadow of these black people in India is supposed to cause pollution or contamination. And the black folks that we're talking about tonight are without question, to me, the most oppressed people in the world. Not the most oppressed black people in the world, which says a lot right there, but the most oppressed people on the planet. Now, you've heard all kinds of horror stories in The Good Life. Um, I was fortunate a few months ago to... <laughs> I was fortunate a few months ago to have the opportunity to introduce a black woman from Australia, a sister named Grace Smallwood. And she talked about her own personal experiences and what it meant to be a, a so-called Australian Aborigine. The fact that when the British came in the late... 1700s, black people in Australia began to be used as target practice, or they were murdered to be used as dog food. And in some parts of Australia, even until the 1960s, like in Queensland, Australia, black people, it is said, were not allowed to wear shoes. That European convicts, because those were the white folks who settled Australia, would oftentimes play a game with black infants, and they would take the mother, and they would take a black family. And it's nice to see we have some families here tonight. I'm a family man myself now, I'm happy to say. Uh, they would take a, a family of black people and they would murder the father or the husband. But before that, they would rape, you know, his wife in front of him. And then they would take the man's head, the black man's head, they would decapitate it. And then somehow or another, fix a rope and tie the head around the widow's neck as they repeatedly sexually assaulted her. And then while the mother was still alive, I want you to hear what I'm saying, they would take infants and bury them up to their neck in the sand, and then stand back and like a football, take turns to see who could kick the heads off the black babies the farthest. This is a game. They used nuclear testing against black people in Australia. Until 1967, black people in Australia were counted as part of the flora and fauna. Did you hear me? Until 1967, Black people in Australia were not counted as humans. They were counted as part of the flora and fauna. So, you know, we've suffered. We've suffered over here. We've suffered all over Africa. But in India, the suffering has been that intense, that extreme, or more. But what makes it different is that it has been going on for something like 3,000 years. So that the indoctrination of inferiority as applied to black people in general and black untouchables in particular are unprecedented. Let me read you a bit, and I'm going to deal with the history. But let me just read a little bit about what the life of the black untouchable was like. I'm reading from this work here that I edited, uh, The African Presence in Asia, which has contributions by a black man named V.T. Rashekar, the first person that, the person that wrote this book. I did not write this book, I wrote the afterword to it and Velu supplied the photographs. And by the way, this is on the cover of the book is a black woman from South Central Australia. I'm sorry, South Central India. And she's in tears, as you can see. And it says on the cover, the outside world hardly knows in India there's a 3,000-year-old 3, problem called untouchability. And when you come to know the real facts, you will be in tears. So if we had a little laughter earlier, it may be good to kind of lighten the mood because it's a very brutal story and it's not for the faint-hearted. I went to India on a historic trip in 1987 in October and I tell you for six months I was just terribly depressed moping around just seeing the reality of our people there. Let me read a bit about what the life was like for the untouchables. The existence of untouchability 
has been justified within the context of Hindu religious thought as the ultimate and logical extensions of karma and rebirth. Karma and rebirth. Hindus believe that persons are born untouchable because of the accumulation of sins in previous lives. For caste Hindus, any physical contact with an untouchable was regarded as polluting. During certain periods in Indian history, untouchables were only allowed to enter the adjoining Hindu communities at night. And indeed, the untouchables' very shadows were considered polluting, and they were required to beat drums, and I hope you're listening to this now, and make loud noises to announce their approach so other people could scurry out of the way. Until the 1920s in some parts of India, for example, the large West Indian city of Pune, untouchables were not allowed to enter the city limits within the hours of 9 a.m. and 3 p.m. because it was thought their shadows would be too long because of the position of the sun. Untouchables had to attach brooms to their backs to erase any evidence of their presence. And cups were tied around their neck to capture any spittle that might escape their lips and contaminate the roads and the streets. So spit came from their lips, the streets would be contaminated. Their meals were consumed from broken dishes and their clothing was taken from corpses. They were forbidden to learn to read and write and were prohibited from listening to any of the sacred Hindu texts, the Rig Veda, the Mahaparata, the Bhagavad Gita, the Upanishads, the Brahmanas, Regular access to public wells was denied them. They could not use ornaments, and they were not allowed to enter Hindu temples. You could be killed. Untouchables have been killed within the last few years for merely entering a temple. In some parts of India, as I understand it, there are temples, and there's a ring of stones around the temples, approximately 30 feet or 50 feet from outside the temple walls. And the untouchables are not only not allowed to go inside the temple, they can't go within the ring because it is thought their shadows will cause the gods and the temples to be polluted. That's the nature of Hinduism. The primary work of untouchables included scavenging and street sweeping, emptying toilets, the public execution of criminals, the disposal of dead animals and human corpses, and a cleanup of cremation grounds, all of which were regarded as impure activities by caste Hindus. The daily life of the untouchables was one, as you can see, of degradation, deprivation, and humiliation. Now, unfortunately, that has not changed very much. Uh, today, for example, the literacy rate among untouchables, untouchable women is about 7%. So they kept very uneducated, formally, and no, I won't say uneducated, they kept illiterate. Uh, untouchables in urban India in places like Bombay and Calcutta and Madras and Bangalore are crowded together in squalid slums while in rural India where the vast majority of untouchables live they are exploited as landless agricultural laborers and ruled by terror and intimidation. Uh, every year within the last 10 years the amount of atrocities committed by untouchables by the other caste have averaged 10 to 15,000 cases per year. They include gang rape, they include arson, they include murders. It's not unusual to hear about untouchables in India being burned alive. Reminds you very much of what was happening to black people over here in certain periods. I have photographs that were being given to me by members of the government in India where a black boy was burned to death and I have photographs of his ashes and what have you. You have stories about untouchable children who were forced to eat human excrement as a form of punishment. Velu has an article that he just brought me, and this is not stuff we're making up, that was 